It'll be useful uh, to have Romans chapter 2 open. We look at that together. Heavenly Father, open our hearts and minds up to your word. Make us known, make known to our hearts the great truths in your word this morning. Amen. Well, I shared on Facebook, uh, I said, um, I asked an open question uh, on Facebook, what, what is it in our society where people are moral policemen? And what is it where you hate that, where that happens? And it went off. Uh, people had so many things where they just hated uh, people in our society being moral policemen. Uh, every, you know, almost everything was covered, uh, from how you raise children uh, to how you do your work, um, how Christian pastors responded to COVID and made their congregations feel judged and guilty. Uh, it was all out there. It was amazing. We hate being judged. What we're thinking about this morning is the problem of moralism. Um, if you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, uh, you're not a believer, uh, you know, you're, you're not sure or you're not sure what you think, um, then this really probably isn't a sermon for you. Uh, if you're, a, you're an atheist, uh, you're kind of agnostic, or you're an anarchist, uh, you've come from the wrong Sunday, uh, you should get up and go, because uh, this sermon is really pitched for the moralist. This sermon is pitched for the, the Jew, any Jews among us. Uh, this sermon is for the rule-keeping Christian. That's what's on target here. And the issue here is the problem of moralism. Not the problem of morals, the problem of moralism. Because uh, if, if it was the problem of morals, then I'd glance back at Romans chapter 1. Paul lays out a lot of, at the end of chapter 1, a lot of moral things and actually condemns moral chaos and evil. And, and is like, so what's the difference? Well, moralism is this, I'm bringing my morals to bear on you. <laughs> it's not just that there's a moral standard, but I am judging you by my standard. That's kind of moralism. I'm sure you've felt it when other people have done that to you. Maybe you felt it a little bit. You've gone to an event. It's supposed to be black tie and you turned up in your Levi's. Have you felt the judgment? Not by everyone, but by some. You should have been there in a long sleeve shirt, but you were there in short. I know someone who turned up to work in board shorts. Got sent home, I believe. Is that true? No. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Hypothetically. Well, look what Paul says. What's the problem with moralism? It's actually really profoundly deep. And Paul, the, um, the 16 verses here, it's actually, um, the problem is so deep that Paul spends a lot of time on it. And the argument is quite complex because he actually wants to unravel it for our hearts. See, we're in danger when we judge others. Look with me, Romans chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, every one of you who judges is without excuse. You see, He's just done Romans chapter 1 and the moralists of the ancient world, the, some of the Greek philosophers and the Jews would have heard Romans chapter 1 and would have heard about things like uh, quarrels and deceit and envy and murder and malice and slander and said, yeah, yeah, that's, that's exactly what it's like amongst all the nations who don't know God. That's what it's like amongst all the Gauls, the French people. I know we think they're the height of sophistication now. But the Gauls were the grubby Gauls a few thousand years ago. Oh, that's typical of the barbarians and the Germanic tribes. That's my background. Um, and, and they would have judged them. But look what Paul, he says, 2 verse 1, Therefore, every one of you who judges is without excuse. For when you judge another, you condemn yourself, since you, the judge, do the same things. In summary, when you point a finger, you've got three pointing back at you. And interestingly, you've probably got one pointed up at God. See, what's the, but what's the danger in that? Why is that so problematic? 
Well, what it is, is what we do is we construct a window, a wall and a window, and we look through that wall and through that window at all the problems on the other side of the window and on the other side of the wall. And we're looking into all the problems out there and we're never looking on our side of the wall and on our side of the window. See, by, by having something to look at and condemn the world out there, it means we don't look at our own problem and we get to hold on to two things. We get to hold on to our self-righteousness. This side of the wall is the good side and we don't see our own sin. And Paul just wants to lay it away. He just wants to, out of love and the need to show people the gospel, says, don't you realize that actually condemning others is, is what you do to excuse yourself? You condemn others in order to excuse yourself. Do you think it's true? See, that's part of why I think there's such emotion in judgment. And so moralism is because the person is actually engaged in not just telling you what you've done wrong, but they're engaged in an act of self-protection. <laughs> Thank goodness I'm not like them. Thank goodness I'm not like you. That's what pe people don't say that. That's what's going on in the heart. But Paul says, whenever you do that, you have three fingers pointing back at yourself. And Paul says, look, judging doesn't help you escape judgment. Here's the next movement in his argument. Verse two. Now we know that God's judgment on those who do such things is based on truth. What things? Well, all the evil and wicked things. He talked about Romans chapter one. But verse three. But do you think any one of you who judges those who do such things yet do the same will escape God's judgment? Can, can you see what he's trying to do there? He, he, he's, a, he's, he's driving to the fact that because you think you can judge others, that, that you'll be fine. And he's saying you're actually hiding from your own sin. It's like the wall I'm talking about. You've got the wall. You're on this side. They're on that side. You can look through the window, which means you don't have to look at yourself. And Paul's saying, no, you've got to look on this side because God is above all and is looking down on you. What's it like? I don't know if you're into watching sport. Uh, you know, I, I'm not a huge sport watcher. I'd rather kind of do it than watch it. But, you know, I like to watch the international games. And I like to watch Australian rugby play New Zealand. But have you noticed just how bad all the refs are? I mean, they're so one-eyed. Can't they see all the wrong things that the New Zealand players are doing? I mean, good, they're so terrible. There's so many illegal things. Whereas, of course, the Australian rugby players are all bathed in gold. And around all their heads are little halos. That's why they wear green and gold. But isn't that what we do, right? We pick a side and we cannot see what's wrong with our side. We can only see what's wrong with the other side. But Paul says it doesn't work like that with God. See, God's judgment is based on what in chapter, in, in chapter 2, verse 2? Based on what? Based on the truth. God sees all. God knows all. <laughs> he said, you, you might not see your own problems. And the reason you can't see them is you keep looking through that window at other people. Well, you love your side so much, you can't see the problem with the other side. Sorry, or well, you hate the other side so much, you can't see the problem with your side. But see, notice what Paul there says. He says, you do the same things. You do the same things. And lots of moralists and rule-keeping people would say, I do not do the same things. How dare you accuse me of the same things? I've never murdered anyone. I've never committed adultery. But remember Jesus' word in, in Matthew's chap Matthew chapter 5 through to 7. He goes right to the heart of it. And he says, what's, 
What is it that leads to murder? Hatred in the heart. The real problem in some sense, I mean, murder is a problem, obviously, don't get me wrong. <laughs> but the, 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 the thing that leads to murder is hatred in the heart. And the judgmental person probably carries around more hatred in their heart than the other person. And the difference is between the, the judgmental moralist is not less hatred in their heart, but a lack of courage to act on their hatred and commit murder. And the thing is, the person who grew up in a context, middle class or good morals, or backing the Australian rugby team, you know, they, they can't see that if they were in the same situation as that, the person who grew up in a ghetto or, or the person who grew up in a violent crime, who would act on their hatred by pulling a knife or pulling a gun. We would do the same if that was our context. Paul says, we do do the same. And actually, it's been exposed in the media, hasn't it, recently? Uh, that, high class, that high finance person, I think it was about two years ago, who ripped off millions. You know, she's from a wealthy family. She worked in high finance. And she ripped off millions and millions of dollars from other people. And then she's disappeared. And they found her leg. And the question is, has, did she take her own life? Or did someone take her own life? But the question everyone was shocked is like, how could someone who's so rich and so wonderful and, and so glamorous, have, who had such a good life, have such greed? But wealth and power and beauty and prestige don't protect us. Paul says we do the very same thing. Now you might respond, yeah, yeah, okay. But can't you see that God is judging the others? I mean, look at, look at those people. Their life is a mess. Their life is a wreck. The druggies, the prostitutes, uh, you know, the people who have no morals. Their life's a mess. Of course I can see that God's judging them. But look at my life. It's fine. Well, Paul makes another argument. Can't you see God's kindness to you? Look with me, verse 4. He says, or do you despise the riches of his kindness, restraint and patience, not recognizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. So he's saying the reason God's judgment hasn't fallen on you is not because you don't do evil or you don't think evil, or you, but actually because God is holding back his judgment in order to give you time to repent. God's kindness is there so you might repent. You might come back to God, but you refuse to. Verse 5, because of your hardened and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment is revealed. See, here's the logic. Here's the logic. Paul's saying you condemn others, but you do the same. God knows it because he knows all truth. So why can't you see what, that you haven't faced God's judgment yet? It's not because you're a better person. There's only one reason. God is being patient. God is being patient. God is giving you time to turn back to him in repentance. And see, if, you, if you're a moralist, you, you are in the wrong with God. And it's not that judgment hasn't failed. God is being patient. But the interesting thing here is, notice what he says. You despise God's kindness and restraint. You despise it. He's putting them in the same category as the people in Romans chapter 1. Who, although they knew God's goodness and his glory, did not thank him and did not acknowledge him. So he's actually saying, you might look down on the atheist or the pagan, or you might look down on those who have no morals, but you're in the same category. God has been kind to you and judgment hasn't fallen on you. And instead of you recognizing that you need to turn back to God, you spend your time judging others. And so there's a double sin. There's your own rejection of God's kindness and goodness and generosity to you. And there's the condemnation of others. You're doubling down on your wickedness. You're, you're worse than the atheist, he's saying. You're worse than the unbeliever who doesn't know anything about God. You think you don't need God. 
You think you don't need his mercy. You think you're good enough to save yourself. You find your self-worth in your rule keeping and your morality. You worship your goodness. And therefore you despise God and what he's done for you. Who's, who's Paul talking to? Well, he's talking to the Jews. He's talking to the moralistic Gentile. But isn't he talking to us as believers? Isn't that, isn't that easy for us to do? We know God's standard. It's good. Maybe we've been changed and transformed by the gospel. But we, we look outwards and instead of having hearts of compassion... And, and hearts that ache for the lostness of the world, we're like, well, haven't they stuffed up? Oh my goodness, look how they act. Look what they do. Can't they see where that's taking them? Now, maybe you don't do that in your personal conversations, but my goodness, I come across a lot of that tone online by Christians. And it's awful and it's false. Paul, in that line at Searing, can't you see that you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed? <laughs> Your judgment is unrighteous. His judgment will be righteous and wrath will come. You won't escape it just because you can see other people's problems on the other side of the wall. Well, why does Paul know this is the case? Well, see, he's already said that God's judgment is based on truth. The truth of what? Well, the truth of what we do. The evidence. The evidence. The evidence of what we do and the evidence of trusting God. Look at verse 6. God will repay each one of us according to his works. That's a quote from Psalm 62. The last line of Psalm 62. He will repay each one according to his works. Eternal life to those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honour and immortality, but wrath and anger to those who are self-seeking and disobey the truth while obeying unrighteousness. What will God do? God will judge based on what we've done. Now, you might be, well, hang on, Glenn. Don't you keep saying that God saves by faith alone and now you're saying God it's, it's what we do. Uh, hear me very clearly. A Christian is saved by faith alone, by trust in Jesus alone, because God judges on works. <laughs> God's judgment will fall on works, which is why the only thing that can save us is that we put our trust in Jesus. Because if the judge, if we were saved by our works, we wouldn't be saved. But then you go, hang on, Glenn. It sounds like in verse 7, Eternal life to those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honour and immortality. But wrath and anger to those who... It sounds like salvation is by works. Or it sounds like it's works being added to faith. No, I think not quite, though it does sound like it. Uh, what's going on? There's two clues here. It's Psalm 62 in the background where there's two groups of people. There's, there's, in Psalm 62, there's those who know and love and trust God and those who despise God. And, and the psalm is not about those who do good. It's about those who know and trust God. And at the end, they'll be judged on works, but their, their works will flow out of the fact that they know and trust God and rely on him. And you see it in another way in the verse itself. Uh, look with me, uh, verse, verse 8. But wrath and anger to all those who are self-seeking and disobey the truth. Which truth? They disobey the truth of the gospel. Do you remember? It's the, the gospel that brings obedience of faith. It's the gospel that brings the obedience of faith. They refuse the gospel and therefore their lives are not changed and transformed. There's no obedience that's flown. So what's, what's Paul talking about? What he's saying is that an apple tree produces apples and an orange tree produces oranges. And so what he's saying here is if you... He's looking forward in some ways to the rest of the book of Romans and saying, for those who put their trust in God, what that looks like is persistence 
in seeking God's glory, not their own glory, seeking God's glory, seeking God's honor, seeking the immortality and the life found in God. So they will prove their faith, in a sense, by how they live. But it's not how they live that saves them, but it's the, it's the evidence of their trust in God. Does that make sense? Is that clear enough? <laughs> he's, not, he's not saying you're suddenly saved by works, but God will judge based on works. But what are the works that a believer will do? Well, actually, they, the works that we will do are the works that Christ has done in us and enabled us to do, but only because we put our trust in Christ. And Paul wants to go deep on this because he knows our society kind of categorizes itself and views itself and says, that might be true of other people. That might be true of people on the other side of this wall. That might be true of people who play rugby wearing black and white. But it's not true of people who wear green and gold. No. Paul says, no, there's no favoritism with God. See, Paul's whole point is to try to reveal to both the Jew and the moralist and the rule-keeping Christian that just because they look down on other people in other nations doesn't mean they meet God's standard. Verse 9, there will be affliction and distress for every human being who does evil. First to the Jew and also to the Greek. Why has he picked the Greeks again rather than just the nations of Gentile? Because society looked to the Greeks. They looked to the philosophers. They looked to them as the high point of kind of moralism and culture. Do you know Seneca, uh, the, the Greek philosopher, the moralist, he would have looked at Romans 1 and said, yes, tut, tut. All those nations who aren't sophisticated like us, who are, he, he spent a lot of time moralizing. But you know what Seneca did? He helped Nero put Nero's mother, Agrippa Pina, to death. Whenever you point the finger, there's three pointing back at you. See, God's judgment, though, will be for the Jew and for the Greek, but there will be glory and honor and peace for everyone who does what is good, first for the Jew and also for the Greek. There's no favoritism with God. God's not going to treat the Jews differently than he's treating the Greeks or the Gauls or the Germans or the Australians or the New Zealanders. God's judgment is based on truth. The truth of what we do do and don't do. The truth of what we do think and don't think. Being a Jew won't protect you from judgment. Being a moralist won't protect you from judgment. Being a kindergarten teacher won't protect you from judgment. Being an environmental campaigner. Looking at all the people who litter and pollute. While you use green cling wrap. That won't protect you. Being a nurse who's taken low pay and deals with other people's garbage and problems, won't protect you. Being a Christian minister won't protect me. There's no favoritism with God. And isn't that a profoundly good thing? Isn't it? Because don't we hate it when the people who are connected or rich or powerful seem to get away with what they do wrong because of their connections? Paul is saying, no, 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 with God, it doesn't matter. Even if the Jews had a 2,000 year or 4,000 year history with God, God will judge by works. And the Jew might say, well, hang on, though, come on. There's something special about this. It's going to come up again in the book of Romans. There's something special, though. We have the rules of God. And Paul's like, knowing about the law, knowing about the rules of God isn't enough. 2 verse 12. All who sin without the law will also perish without the law. But all who sin under the law will be judged by the law. For the hearers of the law are not righteous before God, but the doers of the law will be justified. Paul's saying it's not enough to just hear the law. It's not enough just to know what is good. Verse 13, it actually will have to be the doers of the law. You have to have done it. See, Paul's ch challenging us who go, oh, I'm a Jew. I'm special. I've got God's law. If, and if I do judge people, well, it's on God's terms, not on my terms. 
I mean, I, I'm only using God's standard. But Paul's response is, no, no, no. Hearing the law is not enough. If you want it to be justified by the rules, you have to do every single thing in the rules. Not keep most rules. Not keep some rules. You would have to obey every law perfectly. And then God would say, yeah, you're justified by your deeds. But it's a problem, isn't it? Because you know what it's like when you know the rules. Anyone here an oldest child? Yeah. What's it like being a younger sibling to the oldest child? Insufferable, because you're always being judged by the oldest child who knows the rules so well and keeps the rules because they're closest to mum and dad. <laughs> and so you know what you are, oldest child? You're a condemning hypocrite. So have you kept the law of compassion and mercy and kindness and justice? No, you have not. See, the Jews thought of themselves as the older brother of the world. And I think Christians who know God's law can fall into exactly the same trap. We go, oh, look at the, look at the world. It's gone off the rails. They're hopeless. Stupid idiots. We've got the older brother syndrome. But yes, you could be justified by works if you kept them perfectly. In which case, you're the Messiah. And I know most of you. Yeah, not even close. And that's true of me too. So Paul then responds, though, to a broader point. And we're on the way home here. We're almost there. Um, look at verse 14. So that when the Gentiles, who do not by nature have the law, do what the law demands, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show the work of the law is written on their heart. What, what Paul's trying to say here is he's trying to say, yep, okay, the nations, not the Jews, they might not have the law. And you might say, well, is it, God, is it just that God would judge them if they don't have the standard? And Paul says, actually, they do know the difference between right and wrong. Yes, their moral code, their moral compass might waver all over the place. They might say this is bad and this is good when that's good and that's bad. But they do have a moral standard. Every nation around the world has, has a moral standard. Everyone has a moral code. And in a sense, God in his kindness has allowed that to be in our hearts so that the world, even though it's in sin, is not full of anarchy and perpetual pain. It's the doctrine of common grace. And he's just saying the whole world has a moral code. All nations and communities have a moral code. It might be skew if, it might be broken, it might be judgmental, but it exists. You see it like this. C.S. Lewis puts it like this. Has anyone ever said, how'd you like it if they did that to you? See, what, what you're doing is applying the moral code that you know. That, gee, I shouldn't do this to them because how'd you like it if they did that to you? you, you or, hey, I don't know if you ever did this as a kid. Hey, I gave you a piece of my you know, morning tea. You ought to give me a piece of your morning tea. What, what, what you say, even little kids, right? They go, hey, it's just justice here. I gave you a piece of my cake. You should give me a piece of your ice block. That's all of us have this sense of moral code. Well, is that going to help us? Not necessarily. See, Paul's saying, even those of us who are from the nations, who have a moral code, not the same as God's and not as good as God's, but still don't keep it. Look at Paul's answer. Now, their conscience confirmed this. Their competing thoughts either accuse them or even excuse them. He's saying your conscience, when your conscience twinges you, when your conscience says, oh, that's not the right way. That's not what you should do. Now, our, con our consciences are deeply informed by our culture. That's why the standard in society shifts all the time. But it's there. It's given to us by God to kind of give us a kick in the butt occasionally so that the world is not as wicked and evil as it could be. But Paul says, look what will happen. They're competing thoughts. He's saying consciences don't always match. It's not always the same. Not everyone holds the same standard. There's a lot of disagreement and lots of it's wrong. 
but their competing thoughts either accuse or even excuse them on the day when God judges what people have kept secret. Saying on the day of judgment, God will use the nation's standard of morality and actually use that against those who, in a sense, hold it up against those who didn't know his law and said, how have you done? And his judgment will be based on truth. God will take into account our own understanding of morality on the day of judgment. You think, what will happen? You know, doesn't God care about the nations and tribes that haven't heard of him? Yes, God is utterly just. God will take into account on the day of judgment what they should have known from him, from creation, and how they've lived and conducted themselves in order of their own standard of morality. So where have we come to? There's a lot going on in this passage. It's very tightly argued because Paul wants to really help his hearers. And what he's trying to bring them to the point is that only the gospel saves. See, all go- Paul's goal in this is to show to the religious person and the moralist that just like the atheist and the anarchist, they are under God's judgment and they will face his wrath. Here's the problem with moralism. See, do you, do you shake your head in wonder at the stupidity and sin of others? But you don't shake your head at the stupidity and sin in your own life? then Paul is talking to you here and you're in a dangerous place because you don't see that you're worthy of God's judgment and you're so busy looking out the window that you can't see your own problems. Do you think that God doesn't have the right to cast you off right now because you go to church regularly and you've done good and you've helped people? Then Paul is talking to you in this section. Do you think that deep down that you meet your values and your standards and therefore that you'll be fine when you have to stand before God in judgment? Then Paul is talking to you in this section and saying you are in great danger. You stand on the thinnest ice and it is ready to break through on the day of judgment. Are you tempted to rely on your good works to bolster up your sense of self? Whatever standard you've got for your good works, be it being woke, be it being right and conservative, being it being a good person who helps the poor and unprivileged. Well, Paul is talking to you and saying, no, no, it doesn't matter in a sense what's going on on the other side of the wall and on the other side of the window. God's judgment is based on truth. And he sees your heart. What Paul is saying is don't fool yourself. You need the gospel. See, how would you go? How would you go? Imagine that your phone was always recording you. Actually, don't imagine it probably is. Your phone is always recording you. And that's a bit, you know, that's a bit like, makes us a bit nervous, right? Because Google's ending up with our data or Apple or Facebook. But now imagine, it's a little bit scarier than that. Imagine it's recording not just all your words and all your deeds via camera, but also all your thoughts. And then that recording is played out on the day of judgment when you stand before God. And you are measured against that You are measured against what you've said and done and judged on other people. How would you go? Would you fall under judgment? I know I would. Listen to Jesus' words. Matthew 7. Do not judge so that you won't be judged. For you will be judged by the same standard with which you judged others. You will be measured by the same measure you use. That's frightening, isn't it? Frightening. Which is why every person needs the gospel. Because in the gospel, what the Bible says is that Jesus was judged 
bore us. On the cross, Jesus took the judgment that we deserve so that we would not face God's wrath and anger at our failed works. But Jesus has already paid the punishment for our works. And instead, God would see us in light of Jesus' works. And therefore, we would be seen as holy and blameless and perfect. That's why the gospel is the power of salvation. That's why we're saved by faith and not by works. That's why we need Jesus to be judged for us, to save us from our judgment of others. That's the problem with moralism. Let me stop there. Pray, and then open up for questions, comments, reflections. Father, help us. Help us when we're tempted to judge and to use that to hide from our very own sin and wickedness. Father, reveal it to us so that we might cling to Jesus. And Father, pray for anyone here who's not yet come to Jesus, that they might see the very thin ice on which they stand, that they might repent, not despising your kindness. Amen. Mm -hmm.